Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, welcome you to the February 13th <laughs> meeting of the Blackstone Millville Regional uh, School Committee. Uh, I would ask that we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. If we could have a roll call, we'll start on the right side tonight. We're starting on the right side tonight. Oh, what side? <laughs> um, Diane Robin, Blackstone. Tammy Lemmy, Blackstone. Erin Bernacco, Millville. Jane Reggio, Millville. Tara Larkin, Millville. Jack Keefe, Blackstone. Karen Vernon, Millville. Sarah Williams, Blackstone. Okay. Well, good evening, Kevin. As, as you know, we're here for you this evening. So um, I hope your day has gone well. I, you have said that it is, so that gives us great pleasure. Um, but we're going to give you this opportunity to start us off this evening, uh, share any opening remarks you want to share with us, any highlights of an entry plan that you might start with your thinking process and um, kind of tell us where you'd go if you're our next superintendent. Sure. So thank you. It's my pleasure to be here uh, tonight in, in front of you. It's been my pleasure to be here all day. And I really want to say thank you for welcoming me and really being so open and honest with me uh, throughout the day. And I'd also like to thank the faculty and staff and the administrators who welcomed me uh, into their buildings today. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, it was great uh, to see the students and to work with them a little bit and, and to learn a little bit about what their day was like today and to do some little exercises too, get me moving. <laughs> it was a great day. So I think. Uh, the most important parts of the, the entry plan that, that I can highlight for you are really the fact that I want to come in and I want to listen and, and I want to learn before really making big long-term decisions. And I think it's really important that you listen to the folks that are on the ground, you listen to the school committee, uh, and also the community members that are out there that may not uh, have children in the schools and really speak to the values of the community and really know uh, where the community's at. And I think once you kind of take that information, um, you know, my boss has a, a mantra of when you want to go fast, go slow. And really to know deliberately and thoughtfully plan and prepare for what you want to do and for how to put those plans into place. And, and I think that's really kind of the hallmarks of, of what my leadership style will be is, is listening and learning, uh, but then once we make that decision, not being afraid to put those decisions into action and, and to take action for the benefit of the, of the students of the school. So that's really where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm gonna make a real effort to get out there early on uh, to meet members of the community and to meet students and families on their own terms. Uh, one of the things that's worked uh, really well uh, for me as a principal is to go knocking on doors right before school starts uh, to give the welcome back packets of kids that we're kind of worried about uh, from grade eight to grade nine uh, that don't come to the what we call the freshman roar. Uh, we've used that in the past to make sure that those kids are feeling connected to schools. So I'd be asking administrators not to necessarily give me kids that uh, or families that they're they're worried about, but you know I'd be asking our, our principals to identify some neighborhoods to go and canvas and go and just walk around and meet kids and families you know, on their own, on their own terms. Because uh, not everybody's gonna come out to certain events. Uh, we wanna get out there and, and, and do the outreach our, ourselves. Um, some of the other things that I'd be asking from the administrators in every department would be a statement of critical strengths and needs. Uh, areas that they believe that their departments and schools are really strong in and those areas uh, that they believe need a little bit of attention. And I think that that would really form the basis of our work. You know, once we review all of our relevant documents, whether it's a, a NEASC report, whether it's an MSBA submission, it's our budget, uh, Superintendent Himmelberger's plans, you know, we really want to kind of align uh, all of our work so that we're really clear about where we're going and, and why we're going there. And if we need some mid-course corrections, you know, I'd definitely be open to that. I think it's a good opportunity, you know, when uh, leadership changes to kind of put some things on the table that may not have been on the table for a, for a little while and, and kind of get all that stuff uh, out. 
uh, you know, I think it's really important that people feel that they can be open and honest with me about what their strengths and, and also, uh, you know, the areas that, that they'd like to, to work on a little bit more. So I think building consensus early on is really important and kind of taking the, the leadership cues as the voice of the community, it really comes down to the, to the direction that, that you want to set as policymakers. And really, it's my job to put that policy uh, into action. So I think that our conversations would, I would hope they would be really rich and, and meaningful about, you know, what your vision for the district would be. And, and it's really, you know, up to me to put that into action and to meld that with with my vision of of education so I think that's a, a brief highlight of, of the the entry plan um, but definitely kind of meeting people where they're at and making sure that I'm getting out to, to see them and, and not kind of waiting, waiting for people to come to me or, or just events to happen thank you we will move to Sarah Mm -hmm. could give us an example of how you've gone about setting goals and objectives for your schools maybe last year and previous years and then explain how you involved your school committee and other stakeholders in setting these plans I think that one of the things that recently that we've really taken to as a very serious issue in, in, in schools is our attendance rate um, so attendance is really critical for kids. They can't learn if they're not there. Uh, and it's also becoming an increasingly important measure of accountability for schools, you know, as we kind of move away from some of the, the testing based things, uh, attendance rates is really a, a measure that we're looking at, um, when it we're come to, you know, how well a school is doing. So I, I think that's an example where we looked at our attendance rate. You know, I get it daily, but what more do we do with that? And how do we reach out with that? So what I did was I created an attendance team, kind of using best practices that, that, that are out there, involving the school nurse, involving the school social worker, the psychologist, guidance counselors, other administrators. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have an exemplar truant officer uh, who's phenomenal, uh, not only doing truancy, but also residency, which is frankly more of his job than truancy. Mm -hmm. Um, but we sit on a regular basis and we meet and we track kids' attendance. And I think it's also about messaging uh, to families and, and to the community about, you know, those days here and there add up, uh, you know, and they do affect, you know, our school. But I think it's also important that we let families know that when your child is out for a significant amount of time, <coughs> you know, we're, we're checking in and we care and we know and we're monitoring it. So I think it's about, again, bringing everybody to the table, you know, and there have been times, again, you know, I'm a big believer in hitting the neighborhoods. So when kids don't come to school at the very beginning of the year and it's three and four days, I, I, I'm out there knocking on doors. So we got to get all the, the players to the table in the school, but at the end of the day, it's up to the leadership, whether it's the administrators you know, in a, in a school or the superintendent to take action and, and really make sure that people know that we're putting our money where our mouth is. And, and to me, that's, you know, putting my boots on the ground, mm -hmm. literally, uh, so to speak. So I think you look at the research, you develop some plans, you get the important people around the table, and then you take action. But you continue to take action and keep circling back, uh, knowing that, again, in education, Many times, there is no magic wand, there is no silver bullet. It's just concerned people continually coming to the table with best intentions. And, and has the school committee been supportive of this new yeah. attendance approach? Yeah, and, and it's one of the things that, you know, I report to them uh, on a regular basis on kind of what's going on in, in the schools. And, and last year, uh, the, the presentation that I did was kind of one of the critical parts was our interventions. You know, what interventions do we have for our kids who struggle? Um, this year kind of took a more programmatic uh, tact about what are some of the programs that we were offering for kids. But last year, one of the, the highlights that they wanted to hear from all the schools across the district were what were the intervention strategies in use. Thank you. 
Karen. Okay, thank you. The roles and responsibilities of school committees and superintendents are sometimes clear and sometimes ambiguous. For example, budget approval versus budget implementation or personal policy and finance versus personal administration or even dealing with parents and teachers concerns and complaints. Um, would you describe a situation where these roles and responsibilities have challenged you um, and how you work to address them? For, so for example, if there was a parent that went right to the school committee instead of to you as a principal, um, let us know how that worked out and same with budget and such. I, you know, school committees and, and, and schools, you know, these are human organizations, you know, and I think people have to be aware of that and, and aware sometimes of the ambiguous nature. You know, you folks are in the community, you are going to hear things, you know, you are, you are the voice of, of your constituents and I think it's really important that we, we honor that, but we also honor uh, you know, policies and protocols and how we agree that how we're gonna deal with those concerns. And I think it's really important that we're clear about how we're gonna do that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that has worked really well uh, in my experience is that if a school committee member has a child in the school, if they're calling the principal directly, it's about their child. If they're calling about something else, it really needs to go through the superintendent's office so that we're not kind of getting a diffuse message out there and, and really working in, in cross purposes. Because I think lines can get very blurry very quickly and innocent kind of inquiries and, and, and things can quickly become, you know, the blurring of, of lines of, of who's really in, in charge. And I think, you know, that's a continuous conversation that we have to have, that we have to have with the administrators uh, as well, so that everybody kind of knows their roles and, and, and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But I think, the, you know, your ultimate role is to be a, a sounding board for the community and then to take those concerns and the, to direct them to me and, you know, expect me to, you know, have answers or to, to do something about that to address those concerns. You know, but ultimately, you know, we have to be really clear about what, what's appropriate and, and what's not. And I think that there are some really great ways that school committee members can get involved, uh, you know, whether it's on committees or, you know, district kind of policy things um, that, have, that have legs, as opposed to kind of everyday operational stuff where, where it can get murky and it can get muddy. But again, I think it really comes down to our communication and our mutual expectations. Great. Thank you. Sorry. Did a lot there. Got to write down. <laughs> Me and my notes. Uh, Tammy. Oh. We will give you a couple moments to, to read digest. That's a. <laughs> <laughs> So Elizabeth is a fifth, this is a special education question, scenario. Elizabeth is a fifth grade student has, who has been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and a learning disability in the areas of reading and writing. Due to her history of difficult behavior in the general education setting, the team determined that Liz's needs could not be met in her home school in fourth grade. So her educational placement was changed to an out of school district. As Liz is expected to en ent enter sixth grade, the te IEP team meets to re-examine placement for middle school. The out-of-district placement provides data that Liz has developed strategies to handle her behavior more appropriately during the school day. 
since the middle school in the district has a set of services as provided within a specialized program that can meet Liz's needs, the Legal Education Agency recommends returning Liz to the least restrictive environment within her home school. The parent disagrees with this recommendation because Liz has met new friends at her school. What would your advice be when the special ed director comes to you for guidance? I think I would really ask them to review the data to make sure that we have the data that supports the recommendation that we're talking about. And then I think it really comes back to understanding where the parent is, is coming from. It sounds like there were some real challenges with the child ahead of time, maybe you know a history of not being successful in school. And the last thing that a parent would want is to go back to not being successful in school. So it's really about ensuring that the parent is comfortable with the plan that we've developed. Do we have a good plan? Has the parent had input into the plan? You know, and maybe there's a series of supports, you know, that may kind of go away over, over time. We may start kind of more restrictive back in, in the school environment, you know, plan a little bit, you know, start small and then fully, you know, integrate as much as we can into the least restrictive environment. You know, maybe there are some trial phases. Maybe the parent can come in and see the program that we have in action to answer any questions that they might have. Maybe the child comes in uh, for a day to see, to see where we're at. But I think the first thing is we have to have really good and convincing data. We have to share it with the parent. We have to listen to what the parent's concerns are and really get to the heart of where they're coming from and what they want uh, for the child. I think and then we have to put our best foot forward and be sure that our program can meet the needs of, of the child and do our best to, to let the parent know that we do have a program that can meet the child's needs and do the, our best to reach some level of comfort with them. Now, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, but you really got to be sure that you have the right data with you to make those determinations. And I think problem solving, you know, in that world, you know, is something that you know, I certainly feel comfortable with uh, and would hope that the special ed director w would, again, you know, you got to think outside the box and not every kid is going to need the same thing to be successful. So, you know, it, it's a nice little saying, but you've got to have the ability to kind of think on your feet and problem solve with, with parents and kids to make the necessary programs that will make each child successful, particularly with coming back from uh, oftentimes where parents are pretty comfortable in an in and out of district mm -hmm. setting. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Karen. Also a little long, so if you need to take some time reading it, feel free. <clears throat> um, the citizens in both Blackstone and Millville demand value for their tax dollars and transparency in fiscal accountability. In this light, can you tell us about how you would ensure that the budget you propose and the financial plan that you oversee, as approved by the school committee, is as transparent and efficient as possible? And can you include how you would develop the district budget proposal and any history that you have working with municipal officials like town managers, board of selectmen, or finance committee in supporting the budgets you've created? Mm -hmm. I think the first thing, again, it really comes down to the creation of the budget really begins with, with the teachers. Uh, you know, through the administrators, putting down everything on, on paper that they're going to need to do what they need to do for kids. You know, and then through a process, you know, using that zero-based model, you know, really advocating for the things that, that they need kind of outside of the fixed costs. We know there's some fixed costs when it comes to budget, but with, you know, the, the school budget, you really want to get everything down that, that people need. And I think people can't be afraid to really say what, what, what they need. You've you got to say what you need and get it down on paper, because if it doesn't exist on paper, we're never going to be able to have a conversation about that. So I think that's where it starts. And then working with the building administrators to kind of set priorities and kind of know where they're coming from as far as what are the priorities for their schools. You know, it's really important that they have a handle on where they're at with, with their budgets, where, uh, you know, what has to go this year versus what can wait for next year and having kind of a plan to do that. 
Um, so I think in terms of developing that, it really it starts at the classroom level, builds through the school, then you know coming to me in my review and does it match our vision? Does it match our vision for, for where we want to be and for what we, we've talked about? You know, and what are our goals? You know, and you know, in that strategic plan, that 30-day plan, that whatever, you, whatever time frame you want to put on that, is it a three-year, is it a five-year? Um, you know, does that budget support that? And are we really making sure that the things that we put down in that strategic plan we're, we're doing? And I think that's really what it, what it comes down to. Um, and I think that helps with the transparency and accountability because when we're kind of changing the decks on the, on the ship, people lose, they, they lose faith because we said that this was really important one year and then we're saying that this is really important mm -hmm. this year and then this goes away the, the third year. So I think we have to be really consistent in, in advocating for the things that really matter to us over time and also speaking with the same voice. I think that's really critical, especially when there's contentiousness uh, about resources. I think everybody's got to be on the same page. And, and whatever disagreements we may have privately when it comes to that budget process, you know, like when it comes to a, a, a I'll throw in a personnel, you know, I issue that we all speak with one voice when it when it comes to that. And I just think that's, you know, is what really good school districts do. You know, there's that unanimity of voice when it comes to big important decisions. Um, you know, as a building principal, I've had to do a lot of advocating, you know, for my budget, particularly with the school committee, uh, you know, advocating for certain programs, uh, for staff, uh, you know, please not to cut, mm. uh, you know, uh, we haven't been in the adding, uh, realm in my world for a while. We've been kind of talking about, you know, please don't, you know, cut this. Cause if I cut this, I'm going to lose a program, you know, and that's when you're in that mode, that's when things are really getting serious. And that's when you're really impacting the quality of kids' education when programs are going by the wayside. Um, in Lincoln, it's the budget board that really sets the number, you know, for the town to vote at, at the FTM. So I've provided a lot of documentation to them, a lot of support. Uh, they ask a lot of questions when it comes to real specific stuff. Um, so my role has been to support the superintendent in her presentation of the budget to make sure that she has the data and the facts to back up the requests and really to make sure that she's going in with all her ducks in a row when they ask the, you know, the pointed questions. Uh, and we got to have legit, real reasons and, and not <laughs> kind of whims and I think or I know because the budget board spends a lot of time you know, as they should, managing the finances of the town because uh, it's not a bottomless amount of money. So we all got to kind of be on the same page and we got to do our homework and we got to be sure that the things we're asking for uh, are going to matter down, down the road and are really going to impact student achievement because that's where the, the heart of the resources have to go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tara. Can you give examples of quality programs and or educational policies to improve quality of instruction that you have implemented in another school district? Can you give us examples of programs that were not successful and describe the course of action you took as a result? Sure. One of the things that uh, came out of a discussion about the social studies curriculum uh, was a way to increase our advanced placement offerings. Lincoln High is about double the size of, of, of BMR. But there's still, there's only so many courses in a certain model of AP that, that you can take. You know, only so many senior electives. There's only so much time in the, in the, in the day. Mm -hmm. So when we started our social studies curriculum revision, we started to think about how can we get AP World and how can we get AP Human Geography? How can we add these, these things in? So what we started to think about uh, you know, and I still remember the day as we're kind of sitting in my office, I said, well, what if we took, uh, instead of honors early world history, what if we had AP Human Geography as kind of the top of the masthead in, in, in grade nine for our kids who are really ready for that kind of challenge so they could take an AP course in grade nine? 
Well, then what if they followed that up in grade 10, which is kind of a humanities, you know, kind of world history approach, with what if we put AP world history for grade 10, which leads into AP US, and then all the other kind of social studies AP courses as seniors. And then we applied that model to AP language and AP uh, composition. Literature was grade 12. We said, let's do language in, in grade 11. So we really thought outside of the box about rearranging that because we only have so many kids. We said, we can't have it all be seniors and juniors. Let's expand the pool of kids that are, that are ready for those challenges. Um, and it was that work and the, the work that we did in some of our other courses with the scores to get the AP honor roll twice, which was really, uh, really significant. Um, <clears throat> A challenge that we had, I would, I would say, in 2008, Rhode Island implemented uh, proficiency-based graduation requirements, and Lincoln High School chose exhibition and portfolio. And at the time, we, we viewed both <coughs> as valuable. And Rhode Island recently made a change to where you have to have one proficiency-based measure. So we had to kind of take a look at where we were at. And while portfolio sounds great uh, to educators and, and kind of puts a lot of things in place, um, when it came down to it, the, the more meaningful of the two was really exhibition for students. Because every student completes an exhibition, kids who struggle, kids with special needs, kids that need significant accommodations to make that project happen. At the end of the day, they can stand up and they said, I did an exhibition. And that's how everybody graduates from Lincoln High School, and I'm part of that. And I've had more kids say at the end of Exhibition Day, Mr. Mack, I don't think I could I never thought I could have done that, but I did it. That was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but I did it. And that was really the most important thing that we wanted to maintain. So in terms of checking boxes for some accreditation things and, and, and making it easy for us to track things school-wide, portfolio makes sense. But in terms of what's more meaningful for the kids, it's exhibition far and away. So going forward, we're going to have to put some things in place and, and maintain some structures for portfolio that are going to help us do the work that we need to do and monitor really good and rich tasks for kids kind of on our own because we wanted to stick with exhibition because that was the most important thing for the kids and the most important thing that we wanted them to be able to do when they graduated. Thank you. Thank you. Diane. Ready for me? Okay. Please tell us about a time when you mobilized or attempted to mobilize the agencies and personnel in other parts of specific, specifically municipal government, um, a network to support children and families. How would you go about getting those who do not report to you and making the schools successful? So working with municipal government. Again, I think it comes down to a lot of relationship building over time. I think it comes down to trust. I think it comes down to honesty about what are the needs of the town, what are the needs of the municipal governments that are, that are out there, where they're coming from, where we're coming from. Um, the schools are a big chunk of money in, in both budgets. That's true no matter, no matter where you go in, in America. The, you know, the school side is going to be more than the, than the town side. And I think it's about getting people on the same page and sharing that vision. And when we do have those opportunities to talk about what we really need to do, we, we got to be honest. And, and we got to be honest about the fact that there are some things that cost money. You know, I, again, I can't wave a magic wand. I can't fire a silver bullet. There are some things that cost money that are going to be investments uh, that we're going to have to prioritize again. But we have to work together. And I think it comes to sharing that vision having that face time, having those relationships, having the ability to be honest with one another, um, you know, kind of shut the door and hash out what we need to hash out. But at the end of the day, putting kids first at the center of that decision-making process, I, I think, is, is the most important thing. Do we have time for another Yes, two? we do, yeah. 
Um, there are times when simple intelligence is not enough to resolve a problem. Can you describe a complex problem, situation, or crisis that you confronted where you had to rely on more than intelligence, but when you had to call upon your other skills and abilities for, say, communicating, thinking quickly, working with people, political savvy, instinct, academic training, and then intellect? I think it really comes down to uh, I'll give an, an example when we started our, our renovation project with uh, Lincoln High School a couple of years ago. Uh, we hired an architect to do a stage one submission. Uh, we had a building committee in place. Uh, we had uh, an architect with us that kind of wanted to do things uh, in a way that he had done them in other places and assured us that this you know, was all going to be fine at, at the end. And we had a community forum and it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, was not good, uh, just did not accomplish any purpose other than making people feel frustrated and angry and, and, and upset. So part of that was really we had to do a lot of outreach as a, as a building committee to get out there to really get people on board and kind of wipe away that first public forum disaster and, and really convince people that we had a plan, we had a good plan, we were listening to what people wanted, but you know, it was a little dicey, you know, because that forum did not, did not go well. Um, people didn't know what their role is, they didn't know what they were there for. Um, there were just a lot of things that, you know, caused a lot of concern among the, the council, uh, you know, who ultimately <coughs> are approving the project. Um, and, and, and now, you know, we had to kind of pivot and do a lot of outreach and work with the community to kind of build that credibility back. And a lot of that credibility came from putting people in the role of a student at Lincoln High School and talking about how the building affected them on a daily basis and getting people into classrooms and seeing things and knowing things and looking at it and saying, wow, that was the way it was in 1972 when I graduated from Lincoln High. <laughs> and you know, kids in 2018 are learning differently. And, it, you know, and, and validating the fact that the building may have worked in 1965 and it worked for kids that went to high school in 1965, but it's not working for kids that are in 2018. And I think it comes down again to FaceTime getting people in, giving the opportunity for people to ask the questions that they have, and really you know, having that two-way communication. Because if we had just kind of said, no, that was it, that's fine, you know, what's the big deal, and didn't kind of realize uh, that we were really going down a bad road you know, PR-wise, I don't think it would have happened. I don't think we would have gotten the vote that we needed to in, in November. And that came from a lot of work on that building committee, you know, a lot of investment, you know, on the part of the administrator, on the part of the school committee chair, on the part of the superintendent to get people together and really get those, you know, those issues out, out in the open. Okay. Oh, thank you. Tough work. Jack. So I'm sure you're aware of our district's ongoing issue with school choice and the high rates of outs to ins, and I'm just wondering, I think it would be interesting to know how you would address that, especially at the high school level. I think all schools have to view themselves in the way that private and parochial schools do, and I think they've had a leg up on us uh, in the public education world for a long time. For a long time, it was just assumed that if you were in eighth grade at Lincoln Middle School, at Harnett Middle School, at Gallagher Middle School, you were going to go to Lincoln High, BMR, or Smithfield High School, and that was kind of it. And we just kind of accepted that there were going to be some kids that were going to go to other places. You know, that's changed. You know, the funding formula is the funding formula. You know, when those kids leave, that, that is a cost. Um, and I think that one of the things that we have to do is develop a strategy, again, that's not a one-time thing, but addresses what people's concerns are. You know, and I've said this you know, throughout the day. There are folks in Lincoln that send their children to LaSalle because grandpa went to LaSalle and mom and dad met at LaSalle, or maybe they just want a Catholic education for their child. That's fine, and we have to be, and we have to be okay with that because we're not going to win that battle.
the battle that I've wanted to win in the past and that I would want to win here is a parent that feels that their child cannot get their needs met at BMR. And I think that that's really the key thing that we have to do. Now, that there's, there's marketing and then there's programs. And you can't market if you don't have good programs. So really, you have to get people in to see the outstanding and exemplary programs that you have. And you have to do it in a way that's respectful of the process. We moved our eighth grade open house night from February, because which is when we always did it, to November. Because by the time we were doing it in February, those checks were already cut to LaSalle. Those deposits were already made to Hendricken, and we were missing out on those kids. We wanted to be in that conversation early. So private schools open up on Sundays. They spend money on advertising. Public schools have to do the same thing. We've taken out full-page color ads in the Valley Breeze. You know, is it worth the it, – it's not, it's not cheap, but is it worth it to keep a couple of kids from going to BVP? Absolutely. You know, 10 to 1 – return on investment for that. So have to be willing to, to put that investment out there. But then when you get the people in the door, you have to have the programs that really want to make them come to the school. Uh, you have to highlight and go with your strengths. Um, you know, at Lincoln High, I cannot compete with a Division I athletic program at, at some of the other options that are out there. Just can't. You know, it just doesn't, doesn't exist. So we led with our academics because we feel our academics are really strong and can rival anybody else's. So we lead with our department chairs who love to talk about their content areas, and we put them out front. Our kids are great. They lead the tours around the building. We have graduates that come back that talk about what their experiences were at the high school. We put parents out there because we want parents to know that they're welcome and wanted in the school. So we really try to address all the constituencies and put people's concerns to rest, particularly about academics and where their child is going to go after the end of four years. But if you don't start with the mindset that parents have choices and that you have to aggressively position yourself mm -hmm. to be in that conversation when it's happening over the holidays or in the car or you know, wherever that conversation happens with families, you got to be in the conversation, and you got to be doing it in a, in a smart and continued way. We also have a shadow experience, two different kinds. Again, we've changed that over time. We initially did just private and parochial, and now we do a vocational uh, to compete with Davies. Our vocational one has a bit more of a CTE, career and technical education component, where kids spend a little bit more time in the areas that they're really interested in. So it looks a little bit different than our uh, than what we do for our private and our parochial shadow day. So again, learning over time that, you know, one size shadow day does not fit all. Everybody good? Follow up? No follow up? Okay. Okay. Kevin, you clearly did your research before you, you got here. Um, you've spent a great amount of time, almost 12 hours of your day with us. Um, if you were offered the position today, if I could say, Kevin, the job is yours, what would, what would you be most excited about? Um, what might give you pause? I mean, what would, would you um, – imagine some of the areas of concern or challenges how would you celebrate some of the successes um, basically I'm looking for the what's going on in your head right now what mm -hmm. are you thinking mm -hmm. <coughs> if I was offered I would say yes <laughs> so well, that's a good let's, start. Get, let's get that uh, out of the way but I, I think the most important thing is is really to get down to, to the programs that we can really build on you know what are we really doing well and how can we expand them? You know, how can we have some success uh, early on so that people feel like we're moving in the right direction early? I think momentum is tremendously important in schools. It's tremendously important in, in communities. Uh, it's something that you can't quantify, but you know when it's there. Mm -hmm. You know when a school district is moving in the right direction because you can just feel it in the air. And, and I would really hope to start uh, to get people to feel like we're moving in the right direction 
We've got some energy. We've got some vigor. We've got a direction, uh, and the schools are on the move, and the schools are doing uh, great things. I think I would ask the principals really to talk about the programs that, that most concern them or they feel are most at risk as we go forward, and, and really how can we support them, how can we make sure that they're prioritized going forward so that we're getting the most bang for the buck. Um, there are lots of salespeople out there that will tell you that they have the answer to X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are lots of educators who have uh, made their careers advocating for X, Y, or Z program, because uh, you bring in this person, they'll do this. You bring in this person, they'll do that. Uh, I'm not really uh, into that. I, I want a systemic PK through 12 initiative to really get the most bang for the buck that's really going to move the needle when it comes to our kids' performance. So I'm really going to look to the principals and, and, and to the teachers to, to work hard and, and think about where, where we're going to go with that. You know, again, I have my own ideas, but I would really want to hear from them and be collaborative about how we're going to do that because ultimately they're the ones that are going to be doing it every day. And it's my job to give them the things that they need to do what they need to do for the kids. And to communicate that to the community that we're moving in a positive direction. Great. Well, thank you. Any, anyone else? Your opportunity. Do you have questions for us? Do you have? No, I think it was, you know, it was a great day. You know, I, I had a, a really good time. It, it, it went tremendously fast <laughs> that's <laughs> went, a good thing went, went went very fast um so i guess my only uh, you know my questions would be is you know what would be the most important you know things on on your mind if you had to prioritize kind of a task list for me you know what would really be at at, at the top of that at, at the top of the list coming in I'm mean, gonna guess it would be different for every, for each one of us, but uh, for me, it's a it's a, a inno innovative and, but yet unified. I think that you probably saw in this district today, you saw in these communities to, um, today, hopefully, um, people who, who want to move forward, people who who have passion for what they do, people who believe deeply in what they do and are just looking for somebody to, to guide that, unify the voices, unify the direction, um, get the train rolling in the right track with everybody on board, everybody on board, not just pieces over here and, and pieces over there. So that's my where I see that. But like I said, I think everybody might have different thoughts. So anybody else want to? Tackle? <laughs> Good. So, I mean, I think uh, to go on Jane, I think unifying um, ideas and plans for increased and improved teaching and, teaching and learning to sort of move us, move us forward, move the, you know, move the scores forward. And I think, you know, although budget comes up everywhere we go in this district in every conversation any of us has with anybody in the community I think the increased teaching and learning helps that budget conversation I think when community members can see where our scores are in one year and see that they go up talking to teachers and hearing <coughs> the morale goes up because teachers although we all hate standardized testing we do like when we know what we absolutely. are doing works absolutely and so i think the budget comes along when you have that and so for me it's sort of unifying the teaching and learning expectations and and hoping to get again a bigger bang for our buck at the end of the day and i guess i think mine piggybacks that where i think we've been stuck in a in a I don't want to call it a rut, but we're we're stuck right now, and and we need to refocus, and and that needs to be on the kids. Where when you're walking into a building, what's being talked about is the kids and education, because that is why we're here. Um, instead of talking about roofs and boilers and everything that's broken we know it's there but this is why we're here and we do have to fix these 
that's that just comes with every day um, and it would just be refreshing to be able to reset and refocus on the main reason that everybody's here that's for me okay did that help that's it. all right well, thank you for your time um, I'm going to recess this meeting for 15 minutes does that, does that work <laughs> you can put a timer on <laughs> I will readjourn our meeting for the purpose of discussing the three finalists that came into our district. Uh, we have in front of us, or I have in front of me, and Tara has notes if we want to refer back to anything that were said during the initial meetings. Um, but at this point, um, I have received some feedback um, from the people who had made a commitment and came each of the days so people who were here and saw each of the candidates I, I spent some time talking to them and and kind of asking their thoughts you know if they made the effort um, like I wanted to know what they thought and so um, that general feedback um, I think from the majority of people that I spoke with was that the first candidate brought some energy brought some um, very good research and direction and had a vision and had focus um, and they were very excited about him um, the second person um, while nervous um, seemed to let the nerves get the better of him um, and um, seemed to get to get lost in that and didn't seem as as prepared and today's person I think surprised a lot of people um, he had a very positive response from many people who may not have expected that given um, his resume or credentials um, and um, I think the majority of people truly liked his um, proximity to the community the the way he seems to delve into a community um, and um, I'm getting, I'm trying to do the Sarah thing and let's see how I do it if I do it well. Not so easy. Um, and Mr. DeFalco doesn't seem to stay in position for too many years, but, and real change takes three to five years to see results. Um, and uh, wondered if he would um, be committed, although I will say as a response to that, he clearly shared with us that he is looking for a home. He is looking for a long-term commitment. Um, as per Mr. Drolet, I really enjoyed his focus of working together as a team. I feel being in a similar town nearby, he understands BMR a bit already. Um, he generally was interested in the workings of the schools and the district. He um, paid particular attention to talking to students and staff um, and asked a lot of questions. Um, and with Mr. McNamara, I, Mr. McNamara reservations that he only has been in Lincoln, um, there are quite a few differences between the laws and processes between the states to learn. I'm concerned not having assist, an assistant superintendent that could hinder him. However, it also shows loyalty to a district and um, the likelihood that he would stay for a long time. Um, and he did not seem to have many questions. Um, uh, consensus of those who met and there was a small group of people who met um, with all three um, who did not attend the afternoon sessions DeFalco would be somebody that uh, expressed interest in them and the work that they do and, and had excitement and McNamara would add value expertise and communication um, with all stakeholders and both were very positive and they believe would be very productive um, and then um, D Jason, Dr. DeFalco is really good as a district leader, was well prepared for his visit uh, and um, would be an outstanding choice for our district. Um, they enjoyed talking with Rich. He was a good listener and respectful and humble. Um, 
He could be the glue of all the parties of interest. Uh, he works in a similar district. Um, and enjoyed the interaction with Kevin, um, but he seemed less connected to the budgets of Massachusetts and the processes in Massachusetts. That's what I got from the folks in the world. Um, I did um, talk to Towns folks. Um, and uh, in my conversations with them, um, one felt that Jason was tremendously prepared, had a handle on school finance, um, and one felt that Kevin was very well prepared and um, would uh, find some regional um, mentors um, because knew that you know the regional systems were different and was already looking for mentors in that regard. Um, and responded very well to um, the comments. So again, um, Jason and Kevin seem to come highly recommended. Okay. Does anybody have any comments um, in general? I would like to thank the screening committee. You brought us three excellent candidates. Um, all three will be a superintendent somewhere, someday. Okay. We might not be here, but um, they were all quality candidates. They all came um, and <laughs> actually brought a youthful enthusiasm. <laughs> um, usually we're, we're seeing superintendent candidates that are um, generally much older. Um, and so um, just it was surprising. I did not expect to see um, the youthfulness and the energy that we did see from all three candidates. So um, that was, you know, I just please thank the, the screening committee for the work that they did. I'm sure it was hard to whittle it down to those three. Um, and so I, I will start with that. I will add to that that I would like to thank Aaron. Um, for most of you know that we decided to take this process on ourselves. Um, as a school committee, we developed a timeline. We stuck to the timeline. We brought in very quality candidates when we were told we probably wouldn't get many. Um, and we did have a tough time whittling those down. And I do think we brought three very different, um, yet strong candidates to our district. And um, Aaron spent a lot of time coordinating that effort and getting us all the pieces and making sure they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they had great visits. So I'd like to thank all of the staff. Um, Bridget Walsh in the superintendent's office was Aaron's right hand um, gal, gal Friday, whatever you want to call. Oh, but I have a special gift for you, Bridget. <laughs> I'm going to deliver it tomorrow. Yeah. But I, you know, <laughs> there was a, a wonderful job in yeah. cheese, yeah. And, and it, there was a, a, lot of, a lot of work in this process. We are not done. We are not been done by any stretch of the imagination. We have a lot of, of work still ahead of us, um, working with whoever um, accepts the position of our, our superintendent. Um, but I, for one, am nervous about this decision, yet um, very grateful that people came and put their best foot forward so that we have a decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's exciting for our district, and um, I know that we have talked as a school committee about um, really seeing if we could come to a, a consensus about somebody who can um, bring this district forward. And there was a lot of um, energy from the candidates that came forward, uh, a lot of um, excited expectation that we are um, going to do something um, innovative and unique and, and unifying in our, in our district moving forward. And um, I would like to thank Mr. Himmelberger. He has done, um, he has let, he will leave this district in a better place than he found it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard to do. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Would anybody like to make a motion to um, move a candidate forward and consider him as our superintendent? Would you like to discuss all three people more? What would you like to do? We could potentially go through our, see about how people fit with the rubric. I don't know. I feel like I'm so up in the air that making a motion might be difficult without some discussion maybe. 
Okay. I'd like to point out that we have time left in our timeline. <laughs> <laughs> March 1st. We're not done yet. <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> uh, we do, um, and we do have time. We do have Thursday set aside. If we don't feel like we can make a decision this evening, I will say that we have all three candidates who are in searches in many other places, several other places. And we all know that it's difficult to find a, a superintendent, and we have purposefully tried to um, force Aaron to make many late night calls to keep us on. And yes, it's ahead of schedule, but we know that the, the February vacation is coming, and um, and searches are will move forward quickly after that. And so, um, I'm not saying that that forces us to make a decision tonight. I'm just saying I would hate for us to drag on waiting people. We're in a good place. Yeah, we're, we're in a good place. Me. So, okay. Well, if we would like okay. further, do you have some? I, I'm comfortable moving someone forward, mm -hmm. um, but is um, okay. are we looking to? Absorb but I, I, and, and do that on Thursday. I, I, I understand that some people might not be ready yet, mm -hmm. um, and so do we? Does anybody need, like, <laughs> to talk more about it? Um, <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm trying to go. Um, I don't know. I Maybe. see, I see um, two very good candidates. Um, my top two certainly um, are um, Dr. DeFalco and um, Mr. McNamara. Um, and I and as for Dr. Droulet, he he's this is not the right time for him in our district. Our district has some specific needs that I don't think he's quite ready for, and it's um, and so that's I, I couldn't move him forward. Um, Dr. DeFalco, um, I think has been a change agent in another district in a very. Um, dire straits district and has created some sustainable change there um, i think mr mcnamara is very capable of um, creating some positive momentum within our district i just don't see that he has had the experience of dr defalco um, the positive about Mr. McNamara is he has a long term um, being in a district long term, um, and that is a positive. My thoughts are that um, the experience that it, the less experience he has, it would take him a longer amount of time to get us um, moving. In, a, in the right direction. I think we would go there, no doubt about it. It would just be a slow trajectory, whereas I think um, Dr. DeFalco could really um, um, create, he has been a change agent, and I, I think our district needs a change agent. Um, as much as people don't like change, um, he has made a positive change in another district. So I would be comfortable moving Dr. DeFalco forward. Um, but if we're not ready for that, we can we can continue to talk. Uh, all right. Perhaps instead of moving forward, um, is there someone who we could perhaps at this stage remove from the discussion? Um, and I would ask that if we remove from them from the discussion, we do so that regardless of what the outcomes with any of the other individuals, we are saying we would not um, move this person forward to become our superintendent. That we would, this would be somebody that, that we don't see um, was the right fit for us at the right time. Is there anybody we would want to perhaps remove from the discussion? Um, okay. Well, I would have said Dr. Drolet, yeah. but I don't know. I'll if make anybody. a motion to remove yeah. Dr. Drolet from okay. consideration. Um, is, there a, is there a second? Second. Okay. So
So any discussion on that? Um, and I will start. I will say that given the um, reaction from school committee members, given the reaction from um, the community members, um, while uh, people who know him speak tremendously favorable of him as a, a great guy and a, and a, a great asset to a school district, um, I would agree with Diane that I do not believe he is right for us at this moment, at this time. <clears throat> I would also like to hear, because um, I think this will play a big part of the discussion, is we, I, I don't know anything about it, so I would like to hear more about the superintendent mentorship program that you guys oh, okay. have talked about. So I think maybe if we talk about that and what okay. that encompasses okay. and how that would okay. fit with each other. And of I'm the glad candidates. to do that, but we have a motion on the floor. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, so I just want to add to Dr. Julie's, and I'm, I'm probably going to be repeating myself from yesterday, mm -hmm. but I, it wasn't recorded. So um, for me, he was, that was, a picture was painted for us when we started this. Um, and we started with, you know, interviewing MASC and NESDEC, and, um, NESDEC to possibly run the search for us. And they did tell us what to expect for candidates. They told us the, the short-term st stint of superintendents, the average stay is three years now. Um, so honestly, he seemed to be exactly what I thought we were, were going to get um, as a bulk of applicants. Um, I do believe he's going to be a superintendent somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, we had already talked about a mentor, so I feel that with that, he's going to be extremely successful, um, though he doesn't have the experience, you know, to walk in the door day one, that, that is still the next step for him. Um, he was definitely nervous, and I think that played against him being here. Um, so yesterday I had even mentioned that I, just because of the magnitude of the positive remarks we did receive on him from references that he um, gave to us, but people that reached out to us when we published our list, just because they knew him and they, wa they mm -hmm. saw his name and they wanted us to know his experience and how successful he is and how great he would be for us. Um, it, something was missing while he was with us to be able to see that part. So I had mentioned, you know, needing to see him in his environment, um, meaning, you know, a site visit or another, you know, un, maybe another type of setup that would have let us see him in action. Um, I believe he's uh, has the curriculum experience that we need, um, that we're, you know, desperate for here um and and that he almost reminded me of D dr thompson four years ago and that we knew he was going to end up somewhere dr thompson ended up spending time with us as an assistant and is now a very su successful superintendent um in norwood so I, I felt like i was seeing that all over again um, but i do think just based on the other candidates that we have in front of us we um I think we're going to see him and we're going to know his name and wish that he would come back someday yeah. and, 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 in time. And, and, and perhaps there is a someday in a time. But, you know, I will say one of the things about nervousness, because it was um, in this preliminary interview, we had a very similar reaction to that. But, um, you know, we purposefully created a schedule that would be tough on people. You know, mm -hmm. coming at 8.30 to 8.30 uh, was going to be tough. But that first day when a new superintendent is in front of the staff, you know, they don't have people from their school district there to, to let us know that they're comfortable. They don't have people from, you know, the, the people that know them in the community. They're in front of a new group of people. Um, and those nerves, um, while it is difficult, I, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to be in any of their shoes. While it was difficult, I think say something about readiness. I, I think about practice, about preparation, about all of those things. Um, and that's what happens when you get into this job on, on day one. You are now the leader. And those, those nerves in the environment that we put them in were significant. Mm -hmm. 
Any other comments? I, I just want to say that it wasn't done intentionally to wear them down. <laughs> <laughs> fit everything in. We, we do we that needed, later on. We talked about doing the day of that and then an interview, and it right. was really a time it's factor. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And they all walked out. With they I, did. I, yeah, you know they. What? I think they all stepped up to the plate. They did. I absolutely mean, did. Absolutely mm. did. Yep. Any other comments? All right. There's a motion on the floor. Um, to remove Dr. Drolet from our consideration as superintendent. All those in favor of removing his name from this list, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Certainly wish him the best. And <coughs> okay. So, so we have two people on the list. Can we talk about the mentorship program? Oh, I would like okay. To so, Mass, <laughs> and, and I, I met, think that might help yes. add to the conversation. So, I meant to, to bring the actual um, documentation with me, but when I went to the Massachusetts Association of School Committees conference um, that's held in conjunction with the Massachusetts Association of Superintendents conference um, in November, did we go? Did we go in November? Yeah, sometime around there. Mm -hmm. um, one of the sessions that I went to was you know I thought it was training and working with new superintendents you know thinking okay it, but it was that but in terms of a Massachusetts superintendent induction program and what it is is a, a, it is a essentially like a college course program I don't know how to describe it any other than that but anyone who's a new superintendent in Massachusetts is invited their school district of course has to pay for it um, it is a three-year program and what they do in first year is essentially walk a new superintendent through entry plan, vision, planning, creation, action plan, um, and they assign everyone a mentor. It may have been um, a retired superintendent, it could be an existing superintendent, uh, but they, they attend classes. Like there they are professors in this program. Um, I wish Mary Beth was here because I think her father is somebody who's participating in the program. Um, but they have homework assignments, they have to do focus groups, they have to do interview, they have to do that look, listen, learn, mm -hmm. um, as we have heard. And then, and then they process that with their teams, they have team meetings, they have this mentor or supervisor who guides them through that process. Um, they have to bring results back to the community, they have to, to collect data, um, and they go on weekends. It really is a time commitment. And it's, oh, so the first year is that information gathering, entry plan, um, strategic plan process. The, the next year is, I think, the building upon that. Um, and in the third year, I think it's like less meetings, but kind of to still have that mentor, how is it going? Um, where are some areas that you need to, to work on? Um, and so, um, I do have more, because I wrote a lot, of, a lot of comments and questions in a little brochure um, that I intended to bring tonight, and I did not do that. But essentially, that's the basis of that program to guide new superintendents with the aim of making them comfortable in their jobs, making sure that they have somebody to talk to, because being a superintendent is a very lonely job. Um, there's not a lot of people that you have... Um, up a rapport of confidence, you know, you know, you're supervising most of the people or, or they're supervising you. You don't have that, that buddy, that mentor, and, and this kind of ensures that, that you have your support group, I guess, if, if you will. Now, during the interview or during the screening process, um, was this discussed with all of the candidates? Yes. And any responses from them as far as the willingness all, to participate? All seem, all seem to know about it mm -hmm. and all seem very excited to participate in it. Do we know the cost to the district? Um, I didn't want to ask. Well, I was asked, I'm thinking the same thing. I was like, oh, <laughs> $10,000 about over three, you know, I'm sure this over fall it'll change. Over three you know, years. Over three years. Okay. It's what we would have spent mm -hmm. hiring a search committee. It would have, exactly right. And instead we're training a superintendent. So it's, that, to me, uh, and we got Aaron cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well we haven't seen her bill yet but you should go in the business just saying, just saying. i am in the business <laughs> well no in the, for, yeah <laughs> there you go all right so how do we do this well uh, i mean we have to talk about these people so we have so i will tell you after friday 
mm-hmm. I went home and thought, woohoo, we have a, a great mm-hmm. guy. I mean, when you read through the paperwork of the, um, of sort of the change, changes done in New Bedford in the time frame that they were done with Dr. DeFalco working as an assistant superintendent, I, I thought, Wow, that that's great stuff. And I thought, um, you know, one of my concerns with him was could he adjust from being one of many working mm-hmm. through this process to being one mm-hmm. <laughs> with some. <Great. laughs> um, and I think that's a very different sort of approach to how you have to do things. Um, but I thought visiting all these schools in a week and then you know we only have five technically Mm -hmm. um you know i I just i just felt really good about that and i thought um in both the screening committee interview as well as his um all of the interactions on friday he's very data driven he um he came in on that first day and just sort of blew us away with well when your numbers are here you have to do something and I think you should do maybe this or that or that but I'll, I'll listen learn and what, what are, the three lead. L's I feel like right <laughs> and lead, lead. Um, and so I, I sort of thought that and then when today came and again I, I had readily admitted that after the screening process Mr. McNamara was not mm-hmm. the top of my list I am I am torn right now because I, I think to um, Diane's point, Mr. DeFalco seems to seems to be ready to bring certain things. But I think although the average longevity of a superintendent is three years, I think we would all love for someone to make this their home. Um, I think that someone who's willing to do that although something may take longer as he learns and goes through the process i do think there's value in in a good relationship Mm -hmm. being formed with the towns especially the towns if we can get that built then every year of budget doesn't have to be what it is now if 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 the trust is built and we use transparency all the time um, i feel like mr mcnamara is a better person long term but I but I I argue with myself that I would love to see some change short term as well so so I have no decision at this moment but I just feel like that's sort of my argument with myself I really think there's value in a guy who may be with us for 10 years versus someone who may not who who seems less likely to hmm. i mean he may find his home with us too he may right. just fall and, in and love he, with us uh, and, and he, 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 he said lovable. he was looking and for his his home, his home. and he's <laughs> yeah. i mean they both they both said to me you know that that yes they would take the job and yes they would be in it for the long haul i mean they were only you know they they both were looking for deep commitment to get into the schools to get into the what's happening to make a difference and and Jason was very powerful about that um, clearly did his homework clearly had done his research clearly had looked at the data um, and um, you know Kevin was like I said ready to ready for this opportunity in, in his life now as well so I don't know, both oh, gave it to I'm you. torn <laughs> I'm similar to Tammy. I thought after Friday night, I was that was it. <laughs> I was good. And then today, as the day progressed, I said it off camera earlier. As the day progressed, and I spent more time, and I listened to the way he was interacting with staff and hearing his ideas, I felt myself kind of going more towards the, wow, you know, he lives nearby. He's going to be at our events. You know, his references had really great things to say about him. Um, you know. I started kind of going more towards the long-term stay, the nearby, could be at our activities, could develop that relationship. Building on Tammy's, we really need a bridge built. We need to get everybody up and unified in one vision. Um, He has ideas on keeping kids in district and the marketing. And I remember him coming into the prelim screening committee with the flyer, the little postcard that he sent out and boots on the ground, he's going to go out and find the kids. And I, I don't know. 
that stuck with me. I mean, Defal Dr. DeFalco as well. I think similar to Tammy, you can go to each, you can find it, which is why earlier I was thinking like, if I look at our rubric and what we're trying to find, I think they both hit so many of the categories. My concern about Mr. McNamara is, I think his central office experience and his, he's done small budgets. How is that gonna translate across the whole thing? But with that mentorship program, he's gonna have somebody helping him. He's gonna have somebody to go to. I don't know. I vote him split. <laughs> I know I have my rubric out too, but let me go through that. Oh, we got brochures, brochures, and more brochures. Okay. Well, we do have we, a. Do we need um, to end at 10? What? Do we need to end at 10? No, we do not. Okay. We told Jesse we were going until the cows came okay. home. <laughs> We that might, my, we never know when that's that might happen that's soon. The cows could be out there. <laughs> I, my, my child who's texting me won't appreciate that, but must be there's homework. Just to be making done. sure. Um, yes. Well, rubric. let's pull it. Does go. the people have, have their. Rubrics? I have mine. It was, I if you had your binder, it was in the front of it. There was a copy. I know, and I just gave mine to it just, I guess, so I'm trying to compare the two. Mm -hmm. okay. Now you get to do that. Okay. That's good. I only had my one. If I had to sorry. pick a word for Dr. DeFalco, it would be driven. Versus, mm. if I had to pick a word for... Mr. McNamara, it would be like proven loyal. Well, that's two words. <laughs> One word. Loyalty. Loyal. We want both of those things. Um, DeFalco has experience within the Massachusetts system. Central office experience. McNamara is from the Blackstone Valley. We want both of those things. <laughs> Not helping there, Sarah. I know. <laughs> Although I'm going with Where this. Where are we going with Although this, Although originally, um, Dr. DeFalco was from the Blackstone Valley. Yes, he was. So, yeah, he worked. Yes. Yeah. He was in Worcester. Worcester. Um, again, a char if leadership style. Um, DeFalco came in with, with a plan. And I believe that he would be the strong leader strong like clear decision maker and i will tell you that the leadership team in general and i only did not there's only one i did not speak with but the leadership team in general meaning the principals the director of technology the director of special ed and the business manager all felt that jason was by far the stronger of the two candidates in terms of leadership skills yes whereas with Mr. McNamara, like the ultimate team builder. I think that while we are in dire need of direction, we are also in dire need of someone who will unify the district. Again, <laughs> we need both. <laughs> um, and then in terms of just pros and cons, because I was trying to think in terms of where one beats out mm -hmm. the other, um, DeFalco has Again, he has more education. Mm -hmm. McNamara has longevity. What do you place a higher value on? So, okay. Chew right. on that for a while. Chew on people. that, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in, in, terms of, in terms of <laughs> quality, it's exactly our, <laughs> in terms of quality, our, our one thing was somebody who is a good communicator. I think they both, I think have, they both, I think they they both have that. Somebody who offered innovative ideas. I think they both, I think they both, they both offered that. that. Somebody who would be visible. I think I they both, both offered that. Both, but I they think talk both. I felt that on. Um, Kevin might be more visible. Yeah. Yes. Knocking on doors. Uh, Hanging out in preschool. Bringing Mabel to the field. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Jason said that as well in terms of going to the garage and working out yeah. in the yes. workout. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Uh, or whatever, the Sporting workout garage or whatever. And more local, though, and coming to Crossing. events and being Sunday. visible Sunday. 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 Okay, I want, to, I want to be very clear in that we cannot make our decision based Absolutely. upon where someone lives. Because we have no idea. We can put in the contract. We need them to move to the community <laughs> or nearby or somebody. Yeah. But we cannot make a decision based on somebody right. who has a Absolutely. 40 
minute commute versus a 20 minute commute. I've always felt like they already knew where they applied. Correct. They already, right. They've already, been, they've already taken down. the ride. So I don't think that's been a conversation for us. No. No, but I'm just, I'm very clear that that's not a, it's not on our chart anywhere. Uh, Long-term planning. I think Dr. DeFalco has by the far edge. Has, yeah. the has, yeah. has yeah. more experience than that. Uh, supportive of staff. I think they're both there. Yeah. Both. Supportive of students. Definitely, Mr. McNamara. I give him the edge on that one, based on the, based on what Tammy said about her specific story of one student and his own, what he said himself about how he deals with individual students, which is probably easier in the position of principal in a school in a. True. But he did get down on the floor and the just carpet square. And, and just his opening statement to the public, I'm I wasn't there for staff, but he said it was similar that he wanted so I think the way he presented himself to staff was think of that one student that mm -hmm. you're going to make a difference for is that how he presented mm -hmm. it? because mm -hmm. in the in the public session he said think of a teacher that made a difference to you and he said I'm going to think of two I mean we think of a student and a teacher so okay and supportive of the communities both Oh, what, 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 in which way did we mean that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We had it down on all the focus groups. Uh, budget. We have budget, 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 budget. Budget, 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 budget. Falco definitely has budget. I think yeah. Yeah. Well, especially because of the mass, mm -hmm. number one, Massachusetts. Yeah. Yep. And just being uh, a deputy superintendent yes. and dealing with, mm -hmm. I the mean, we're, we're sitting here worrying about um, Mr. McNamara going from a high school budget to right. our budget, Dr. DeFalco will be going from a Huge the budget. city of New Bedford budget to, to us. 22 million, which I think he said he was one could line. Could be a challenge. Was one line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Didn't he say it was his transportation? That could be a challenge. That could be a, cha could be a challenge, could be a challenge yeah, yeah. to be a challenge. not have that large number. I think it will be. But I think either. he definitely has more hands on on a, a daily budget yeah. and yeah, um, with a lot more money. Uh, 21st century curriculum. Both of them. Give it to both, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Marketing. Oh, Mr. McNamara. I think Mr. McNamara. Mr. McNamara. Jason not have as much. He has just the he's fact that he's it. actually done he's it. He's doing it. Yeah. yeah. True. Anybody can have ideas, but he's implemented. Well, yeah, but I would say Jason did, I mean, they gave very similar answers. Like, they could have listened to each other Lincoln in has some. a director of marketing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that oh. makes it a little easier. <laughs> um, but, you know. Am I right? Didn't he mention that? Yes, they yeah. did. Okay. And, they, and they, you know, and, and, you know, again, Jason talked about creating pathways in the high school to encourage, you know. And he did say to us, you don't have a budget problem, you have, or you don't have a school choice problem, you have a market. What did he say? No. Somebody so he me. said, so actually what he answered Jack's question is where I would go with that. Um, I, what I want to point out is I felt like Mr. McNamara's answers were things he has done. already done and, and a vision of what to do, where um, Dr. DeFalco s s stated what he would do. I don't think it's something that they um, – I, 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 maybe I'm not clear if they talk, if he has a school choice issue in New, in New Bedford. New Bedford. I'm I sure they were choice out. They focused on graduation and, but and right, they, they were, were they were focused on a five day school day, school, <laughs> five days of school, and <laughs> which was a very big accomplishment. But um, his answer was, his, they were, right. they had his to, answer yeah. was they start earlier, right. match what. Mr. McNamara yeah. said, Sorry, sooner than years. grade eight, let yeah, kids yeah. and families see this district as a district of one, right. um, Ooh, not a choice. Yeah. Right. Um, small numbers take advantage of <laughs> what we do have here. Um, in that there's a lot to do with the high school because it is so small. There's Jack, more, more we can do with, with the programs that we options, do offer. But more quality, quality options. options. Accelerate. That's what I got yeah. out of Accelerate it. Accelerate and expand him. current yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Long term. So. Oh, go ahead. Both. Are we putting both or are we putting Kevin? Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Long term planning. 
I like is that, that the second time that's on there? Yeah, but this is under. We already um, under knowledge. Oh yeah, we did. So this Three is under times. knowledge. So. Well, this is under. Awkward, it's yeah, on. Four, it's on there four times. It's on there four times. Okay. All right. Special Ed. <sighs> Tammy. I, I mean, I felt like on the question they both yeah, pretty think, much got yeah. there. I yeah. think, like I said, I think the the last piece that was missing is what do you do? Do you go to mediation? Do you do you push the envelope? And I I think. Yeah. Um, like Dr. DeFalco yeah. got a little closer to that. Yeah. But again, they, you know, they both. But I, I liked how they both made it a student focus, though. Mm -hmm. Yes. I really like how they both, yeah. like, that both student has parent. to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they give it a trial run. They both said give it a trial mm -hmm. different ways, but give it a trial run. Sure. Um, teaching experience in a classroom. McNamara. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of the that drawbacks it's all high when we when they were being read. A lot of the drawbacks was lack of elementary, but it's not like he doesn't have classroom teaching yeah. experience. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I could say the same thing. Drawback on Dr. DeFalco is he didn't teach in high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So both. Yeah. What level Equal. was? He was level? intermediate, three to five. Three to five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and he, you know. Um, well, I think they both have teaching experience. They do. They do. Neither of them had long-term teaching experience. Yeah. They both had, what, three years oh, before they started to move English up? English teacher. Evans was fairly long. Yeah, but uh, they yes. also both t um, told us, um, or maybe they told me, I don't know. It, it could have been in a session, but some of them didn't go way back in their their uh, resumes because they focused on oh, the administrative okay. and, okay. you know. Um, yeah, he did have something. DeFalco has teaching. five years. Yeah. His resume. Wasn't it somewhere around Boston? DeFalco had five years on his resume. Hold on. But didn't he say he, there was something not on there, there was, from yes. Boston? Yeah. Yes. Could Could be. Be. He was in this yeah. city. And then six years. Grants. So it's about the same. Six years as the English teacher. I'm uh, uh, administrative high. experience. Oh, sorry. I, I just mm. You missed one. Well, I assume that was a no brainer. <laughs> administrative experience. That's going to be DeFalco. Dr. DeFalco. Uh, grants. Mm. 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 I think they both have, probably think they have both. had some experience. I think Dr. DeFalco probably has more grant experience because of the districts of the, he's of, been right, in. Of what's he, available he will not to match him. that here. We no. will not have those grants Pretty here. Right. So I, right. I don't know that you could. Title one, Title two, Title four, Title yeah. two, Title <laughs> one. Title two. Okay, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Um, I remember now. <laughs> Community involvement and outreach. Both. I think that's both. I think no. they come no. at it both with uh, um, they were both an awful lot of enthusiasm and passion. I think they both ha have um, very um, very nice demeanors and personalities. I don't think you're mm -hmm. you know neither of them come at it. They both come at it with a confidence, but not an arrogance. Mm -hmm. I think you can say that about both. Definitely. I don't think they're going to be, either of them, will be off-putting to anybody in our districts. Um, and so. And both were out there. They both talked about different ways that they were out there in their communities, mm -hmm. connecting with parents and connecting with. I think mm -hmm. just Dr. DeFalco just had that additional energy, and he said that that's how he is all the time, the excitement. Yeah. And the, yeah that was he said, this is, this is me every day. <laughs> it's not just because I'm with you. <laughs> Which, I mean, goes back to what you said, the mm -hmm. bringing I think, yeah, And I think both would demand a lot of the people mm. that work for them and with them. And I, I, I But think I don't that see them being more demanding of um, others than they demand than they are of themselves. themselves. I, I agree. I think they I both agree completely. have that. Yep, so. I think they do. Uh, regional school. Neither. Neither. <laughs> Neither, neither, <laughs> however you say it. Which is sad, but. Uh, dur, dur, dur. Increase offerings. Well, they both said that. They both said that. Both focused on that. Renovations. I would hand it over. Well, what, didn't DeFalco have? Well, that. Yeah. DeFalco yeah. with the Somerville, where he brought yeah. together several schools. schools and but did one. they renovate? Did they have to go through MSBA? I don't. Why am I drawing a blank on that? We, it wasn't one of our questions. Right. Yeah. However, it was more in conversation that most of that came up. 
And, and I but guess he had, I mean, he had done his homework. He had read our NIASC reports. Yeah. He had read all he of our, um, report, you know, all of our report. Like he knew, he wanted to see our buildings because he knew there were some issues in, with building and this. And, and, and I clearly. think Mr. McNamara has gone through the process. Right. I mean, Lincoln yeah. has been going through that process, mm -hmm. thinking of tearing it down, renovating, you know, fighting about what they're going to do there. The So I think he brings part of that knowledge but I think the differences in Rhode Island and Massachusetts are are, are there and in knowing um, Rhode Island and how you're gonna get, finagle the money out of the state <laughs> versus how you're gonna finagle the money out of Massachusetts are two different things but you know everybody Although, can and, learn and please correct me but there were was conversation um, with Dr. DeFalco on um, on the maintenance, though, yes, and, and putting the Making money into part the maintenance of ongoing and, and an ongoing, uh, ongoing so process there was that conversation. Yes, so. Absolutely, yep. And in um, Mr. McNamara's report, his PowerPoint, he has served on NIASC and yes. multiple functions yep. too, so yep. he's got experience yep. in the area. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, we didn't see anything. Um, technology. You think? Um, they were very similar, actually. Yeah. yeah. I thought it's, a, it's a it's a tool. It's not, a, and you have to plan it, and you have to have a long term plan and a short term plan and a plan yeah, plan plan and, and a plan first. for a plan. <laughs> getting punchy. <laughs> I just said that like I think we're getting yeah, slapped. Well, Pro professional development. It's work out. You said that a lot today. I know. Uh, I, I think um, Dr. DeFalco probably has more coaching and um, coaching and and over overall professional development but it, certainly as a building principal you're you're developing the the um, PD in your building um, and I and I do think um, mr. McNamara's long-term relationship with the superintendent would make me guess that he probably is more involved in district-wide PD than a typical high school principal yeah. but uh, yeah. I will say though that um, I, I was personally impressed by Dr. DeFalco's commitment to learning as much about our district as possible to to requesting every union contract to reading every kind of report he could get his hands on and from that you know, already um, kind of developing some some thought and plan process about professional development and increasing um, teacher LC planning time and, and, and how to work our plans right. into the contract negotiations and, and targeting and the also work, work with the the union leaders in terms of you know what what how do we take what we have mm. tweak things around and best serve. The needs of the student. Now, both of these people focused on the needs of the student. Their bottom line for both of these folks were the needs of the student. Mm -hmm. um, from an administrative standpoint and somebody who will be a, a ship of one, uh, um, I don't know. I have to take that into consideration, I guess. Because there, there's not likely to be. Um, so, without so going there, I'm going to go there. Okay. <laughs> Would either one, because we already have everything laid out. I don't know if you want to tally what we just did here. Would uh, we had our salary range already printed, which is 150,000 to 165,000. Oh, <laughs> Excellent. Um, and then it was done. No, I think. I do you see us being on any different part of that scale with either one of these? So no. we're we, we're already saying ten thousand is going towards the mentor program, regardless of who is in that seat. I think that both of these candidates knew our range, and I think both will be offered position within that range. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, if you want me to tally. Uh, Okay, you got one, you got one. <laughs> you got two. Well, you got another one. I don't one. know who I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not telling you who you are. So one, starting over again. One, 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 one. You're tapping. One. 
Yeah, but you don't know who's who. That's okay. She still needs one. To How many do you got? Two. Give me two. You have two? Mm -hmm. That's I have McNamara. Four. You have four. And everything else was both. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, the grid we, we made are, at the PSC. Our chart that you helped create, sir. I thought you had three, Tara. We didn't know either. <laughs> I wasn't telling. I was just saying this person oh, received I one, remember. this person received one, this person received. So in the end, this person had two votes that this person didn't it's have, not. and that was Mr. McNamara. This person had, had four votes that this one didn't have, and that was Mr. Mr. DeFell. She got the third. I think yeah. I, right. I wasn't telling. I can't read your notes. <laughs> so if we were to make a motion tonight to mm -hmm. enter into negotiations with someone, um, with one of these candidates, what um, what is going to be our process after that? Okay, so if we if we make a motion to enter into negotiation with a particular candidate, um, I would then ask for a motion that would consider the second candidate um, to enter negotiations with that person if the first person fell through. So in other words, you know, we're saying both of these people could be superintendent in this district. So the first motion would be, uh, you know, not that we're ranking. But we have to exec come to a decision. That's our job. <laughs> the toughest job we get, we as are, Tammy would tell us. <laughs> um, and so we would essentially make a motion to offer the position, negotiate with one person. Um, if an avalanche happened or they fell in a hole or they got hit by a bus. Or accept a position. Or, or accept a position no. somewhere else. Yeah. We <laughs> would be willing to negotiate with the second person. Oh, well, you just made things so much easier. <laughs> what? <laughs> so and, and so what would be the process so the process would be the contact the first person and I will say to that person to him because they're hymns we already, um, have two, we already have two people. you know that we um Pick well, the we, person that's the yeah, hard part. Yeah. so that we we are very excited um to work with him to become our next superintendent would he like to enter negotiations with us can we meet at some time to talk about the specifics of that before friday um, before friday <laughs> before thursday before noon tomorrow no tomorrow, um, 10 a.m no so um and you know provided that they say yes we'll enter that process um the school committee will have had an executive session where we talk specifics of a contract um we will share that information with him um, this is a lawyer process, so the lawyer will have to draw something, you know, so it's not a, it's not a noon one day, noon, you know, the next day, unfortunately. Actually, it does need to be that, it does need to be that quick. Well. Like a day. It's not a week that no, we're waiting not a week. for no, the lawyer not, to. No, 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 no. It is a very, a very Did quick you? process. And they, and so they will, um, so we will present our proposal to them they will say let me look at it they'll say yeah and we'll be done um <laughs> or they'll say let me look at it let me think about it for two days and we'll go hmm, we'll give you 24 hours uh aaron gives you 15 minutes um, <laughs> and then uh you know if, if they if everything if all the ducks are in order then then we are done um in the meantime i will um ask the lawyer if I can do this, but my thought process would be to um, call the second person and tell them exactly what's going on, that you are a candidate we would highly consider. However, um, we've gone someplace else. Don't lose faith in us. Let's see how the process plays itself out. Um, and I would call the third person and say, we thank you, but at this time. So hard conversations, hard telephone calls. But I don't um, have to make but those are yours. <laughs> <laughs> I've been making a lot of others. <laughs> but I, I, I think that's a, I think that that's you know we don't we don't it it sounds as if we don't want to lose number two. Mm -hmm. It sounds as if the people who work here would like to go home or it feels as if. <laughs> um, but we would not like to lose number two, and I think that that we need to keep whoever that number two is in the loop so that. You know, and they may say, if I'm not your first choice, I don't want to be it. I mean, they may say that. Mm -hmm. I, the first person may say, you know, I've given it some thought and, you know, whatever. So I would get the reaction from the first person before a conversation right. with the second person. But if we enter negotiations with that first person, I think we have to 
clue that second person is. Okay. I would, well, like to, I, mean, I would like to make a motion to enter into contract negotiations with um, Dr. Jason DeFalco as superintendent of the regional school district. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> is there any discussion? It's a hard choice. It's such a hard um, choice. And, and I don't think waiting till Thursday is going to make it any easier. For those of you that are like struggling, I, I did not think it was going to be this hard of a choice, but it was. I, I'm glad we have Joyce. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because there, there was a possibility we wouldn't. Some real right. choices. You know, I hope. You know, there was a time where we said, what do we do if none of these work out mm -hmm. before we met, had met any of them? What happens if none of them work out? What do we have to do? Do we have time to go back? We, you know, we were talking about that. So to have two candidates that we feel could um, lead our district and are capable competent. and competent to lead our district, I think we are very lucky. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I will ask for a roll call vote to enter into contract negotiations with Dr. Jason DeFalco. Diane? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jack? Yes. Tara? Yes. Jane? Yes. Okay, well that was unanimous and that's lovely. Um, okay, so I will entertain a motion to um, keep uh, Mr. McNamara in our um, pool of candidates should our first candidate uh, fall through we consider him a wonderful um, superintendent in this district as well and would like to enter negotiations with him if the first one does not mm -hmm. so somebody can make that sound so better moved. Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, I I can you make that sound better I can probably word it okay thank you <laughs> But essentially, to enter negotiations with a second candidate should the first one fall through. But I think Mr. McNamara needs to know that he met our needs. The majority yes. of yeah. our needs. Yep. Yeah. Yes. It, you know, it came down to uh, mm -hmm. just an experience thing, and not even a a huge right. gap. Right. Right. It was a very close. Yeah. Close I, I think it's. I think it's an administrative experience. Mm -hmm. If you had to ask me, what was my defining push? And again, I didn't expect that either, and I'm thrilled. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, so there's a motion. Yeah, we need second. a motion. Who, second by who, uh, Aaron uh, and second by Aaron. Tammy. Is there any discussion on that? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll roll call. We'll go opposite way this time. Sarah? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jack? Yes. Tara? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Diane? Yes. Jane? Yes. Wow, that was weird. <laughs> Uh, I make a uh, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session um, for the purpose of discussing non-union personnel so moved and, and to only come out second. and we are tend to, to come adjourn. out to adjourn to <laughs> yeah to adjourn you yeah. want to make sure you get the yeah. 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 we're not, not coming returning. back we're, we're, not <laughs> we're done thank you all it's for 10, coming 15. out these days okay so um, yes the screening process so we have to roll call that sorry Diane yes Tammy yes Yes. Aaron, yes. Jane, yes. Yes. Ta whatever your name is. Yes. Tara, yes. Jack, yes. 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 Karen, Sarah. Yes. Executive yes. session. Yes. Um, yes.